Hi, I'm Dr. Casey Bearden. Let me share with you the three most effective therapies that we've found for neck pain relief. First, we use electrical muscle stimulation. The second thing we use is chiropractic adjustments. And the third thing we use in many cases is mechanical traction. The electrical muscle stimulation, for example, is where we place little pads, small pads, on the area of, the, of involvement. And it's designed to generate new blood circulation, reduce muscle spasms, and it also serves as a, a nerve block. The second thing we use, chiropractic adjustments, is where we very gently use our hands and sometimes instruments or a table to very gently realign the vertebra that are out of their normal position and are breaking down, causing pressure on the nerves. And with the chiropractic adjustments, we're able to restore mobility and relieve the pressure from the ligament, nerve, and disc. The third thing we use is mechanical traction. And with mechanical traction, it can be done with our hands or with an, an instrument. And usually with the mechanical traction, it's designed to spread apart the joints, taking the pressure off the delicate sensitive nerves and restoring mobility and flexibility. Most patients report after bringing these three therapies together they're able to restore to their normal daily activities, they're able to restore to their exercise program, and they're able to carry out their shift at work without so much pain because they're not having the muscle spasms, the pain and inflammation, and the overall joint mobility issues they were once having. It also helps with their interpersonal relationships. When you're in pain, especially neck pain, there's just a, a lot of irritability issues, impatient issues with coworkers, family member and friends, and when you're not in pain, especially, like I said, neck pain, um, those interpersonal relationships are, are much better. Give us a call today. If you're suffering with any kind of neck pain, we can help. Without drugs, without surgery, call us today, 356-4656. Good afternoon, and uh, glad to see uh, some people have stayed behind to uh, listen to this talk. I'd first of all like to thank uh, Advanced Cell Diagnostics for uh, inviting me to come and talk about uh, some of the research I've done in collaboration with, uh, with them over the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, I'm interested in uh, head and neck cancer, which is uh, not a particularly common cancer when you think of uh, essentially the big four, which is lung cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. So I'm just going to set the scene a little bit about the disease so that you understand uh, what we're particularly interested in. There's a lot of interest in human papillomavirus, not, notwithstanding the amount of uh, uterine cervix cancer that's obviously caused by human papillomavirus. But this recent uh, edition in Nature, which was a, an Outlook uh, edition looking at the worldwide uh, prevalence of HPV-driven cancer uh, and emphasizing the fact that other uh, anogenital cancers and the fact that uh, oropharyngeal cancer, throat cancer, is caused by, uh, by the human papillomavirus. Now, head and neck cancer traditionally uh, has been recognized as a, a disease of uh, smokers and drinkers. And these, uh, these individuals, uh, certainly in the UK, reside in public houses and uh, are well known to be usually uh, males who uh, like to smoke and drink uh, for, uh, for pleasure. Now, the majority of these individuals are uh, elderly individuals, and uh, when they get their uh, head and neck cancer, have a universally poor prognosis. These individuals typically present with high-stage disease, and uh, there's a less than 25% five-year survival. What we've recognized over the last uh, uh, decade or so is there has uh, been an increase in the number of patients that present with uh, head and neck cancers that don't seem to have any uh, risk factors associated with tobacco and alcohol. And out of this uh, came the recognition that uh, oncogenic human papillomavirus is uh, causative in some of these patients. These patients uh, are increasing in numbers, and I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, the epidemiology in the US that's uh, been published. They typically uh, occur in the oropharynx, this is in the throat. They're usually in individuals who are a bit younger than the smokers and drinkers who get head and neck cancer. So these are individuals who are actually working individuals, usually with families to support, uh, which has profound uh, uh, knock-on effects for uh, whether they're going to get back to work or not. 
typically a male disease again. And one of the things that the media has picked up on is essentially uh, the fact that um, um, some of these diseases are, th are thought to be associated with changes in sexual behaviour. There is a good uh, side to this story because we know that patients who have uh, HPV in their oropharyngeal cancers have a better prognosis. So these individuals do better, and they seem to do better regardless of the, uh, the therapy that they get. This is the US data that's recently been published. Uh, looking uh, at uh, the, uh, the SEERS data, the uh, surveillance and uh, epidemiology endpoints results. And this data is actually generated uh, locally from uh, Los Angeles, uh, Iowa, and Hawaii. I guess a lot of epidemiological studies in the US probably include Hawaii for obvious reasons. Uh, but what we can see here is that uh, this particular curve here demonstrates the uh, increase in uh, HPV-associated uh, oropharyngeal cancer. And you can see from the 80s up to the uh, sort of mid-2000s, uh, uh, you can see that it's increased, and it's more than doubled in number. And this, the trajectory of this curve has uh, raised the possibility uh, in some quarters of an epidemic of uh, throat cancer caused by the human papillomavirus. This is, a, this is the gradual sort of uh, increase that's seen in all uh, oropharyngeal cancer across that, uh, that time period. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, around about 2.6 per 100,000 uh, uh, new cases per year, which in the US, looking at your current uh, population status, is just under around uh, 10,000 new cases per year. These uh, statistics are uh, mirrored in the UK where our cases have doubled over the last sort of 15 years. And we're finding that around about 60 to 70% have got human papillomavirus in them. This data was published uh, in a landmark paper in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine a couple of years ago from uh, uh, Kian Ang's group and Mara Gillison's group uh, showing the uh, influence of human papillomavirus on survival uh, in a post hoc analysis of uh, clinical trials data. And this rather complicated graph here basically shows overall survival. And they define this low risk group here. These individuals uh, have a greater than 90% chance of surviving three years. And these are the individuals who've got HPV uh, related or a pharyngeal cancer. The ones with high risk in the high-risk group are the ones that are HPV negative and are usually smokers and drinkers with uh, high stage. The intermediate group are the ones in the middle. Sorry, I should say the high-risk groups, as you can see, have a universally poor prognosis, around about 40% uh, three-year three survival. The intermediate group are the ones that are HPV positive and are smokers or are HPV negative and don't have smoking risk factors. So we can split them into these, uh, these groups based on uh, behavior and HPV positivity. So essentially in clinical practice, we're using HPV testing of oropharyngeal cancers as a prognostic marker. And this is something as a pathologist that I'm asked to provide as part of our multidisciplinary team uh, meeting. In addition to that, I also use HPV status to uh, to guide my diagnosis when we've got uh, an individual who's got <coughs> a lump in the neck that's uh, metastatic carcinoma. If it's positive for HPV, then that localizes the tumor uh, to the oropharynx and we can direct uh, surveillance of the oropharynx either clinically or by scanning to try and pick up a small primary. HPV testing is also in clinical trials at the moment. So that Key and Ang paper in New England Journal of Medicine uh, opened up the, uh, an RTOG trial, 1016, looking at randomizing patients into two different uh, uh, therapies on the basis of HPV, HPV positivity. And we've got a trial opening up in Europe, uh, which mirrors that trial. We're also using uh, HPV uh, diagnostics in epidemiological studies, as, as I've shown, 
in translational research, separating our uh, tumours into positive and negative ones to inform uh, some of the genetic changes in the diseases. They're quite different biologically. HPV can be used for screening for early stage disease and post-treatment surveillance and obviously can also inform uh, vaccination strategies within the, as public health measures. In addition to that, uh, in the US, uh, the data is so convincing that it's now in clinical guideline documents and the National Comprehensive uh, Cancer Network guidelines includes HPV testing and there's also uh, uh, documentation in the uh, American College of Pathologists. Now, the guidelines don't stipulate which test to use, but the tests that are typically used are uh, uh, assessment of P16 by immunohistochemistry and looking for HPV DNA by either in situ hybridization or by PCR. Now, I just sort of stop and pause now and think about uh, what is a HPV driven cancer. And what we understand is that they're biologically different in terms of uh, the way that they work compared to the ones that are, that are driven by complex genetic changes as a result of chronic alcohol and tobacco use. And essentially this, this shows a rather sort of complicated uh, uh, picture of what the, uh, the viral proteins do uh, in terms of their interaction with the cell cycle and other, other components. But essentially what we're talking about is these uh, uh, oncogenic proteins, the E6 and the E7, interacting with the, uh, the cell signaling machinery. And it's uh, only the production of these proteins, this one, into the E7 interacting with RB, uh, and basically causing an uncontrolled uh, cell proliferation. The E6 interacting with P53, so you're losing your checkpoint and then the uh, E6 interacting with uh, telomerase and making the cells immortal. Now, the E6, the E7, should I say, interacting with the RB causes uh, uh, essentially one of the cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors, P16, to accumulate to very high levels because it's trying to jam on the bricks of uh, 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 cell, cell proliferation. So you get P16 accumulating here at very, very high levels which can be used as a surrogate marker of the presence of the E7 protein. Because these proteins uh, are very difficult to detect by standard methods, and particularly by immunohistochemistry, then we consider essentially the gold standard for uh, defining HPV-related cancers as detection of the mRNA. And usually the detection of the mRNA is done by reverse transcriptor reverse transcriptase uh, PCR. Currently in clinical practice, uh, the, uh, the in vitro diagnostic devices used to detect uh, HPV are based on either the surrogate marker, P16, and typically uh, it's uh, this, this reagent called Syntec histology from MTM laboratories that's used. And then the detection of HPV DNA by in situ hybridization. And Ventana produce a, a reagent, as does DACO and Leica. In the uh, UK and in Europe, our, our devices are CE marked, so these have got the certificate of Europe, which means we can use them in clinical practice. And uh, we're able to use these diagnostics to come up with. Uh, an algorithm to say that essentially if something's P16 positive and has evidence of HPV DNA by in situ hybridization, we, we, we term that a HPV related cancer. I have to point out that in the US you're allowed to use uh, probes that are specific, whereas in Europe we can't before licensing restrictions. So in Europe we're uh, restricted to using cocktails of probes for this. The in vitro diagnostic devices market is also uh, replete with uh, grind and bind techniques and there are lots of uh, ones that have been developed for uh, cervical cancer that are also IVDs but uh, don't really fit into the workflow, particularly in our laboratories which are based uh, on tissue diagnostics. 
Just putting on the end here, this is not a, a C marked or in vitro diagnostic device, but is based on tissue diagnostics and based at looking at what we consider to be the gold standard or the reference test molecule, which is the, uh, the transcription of the messenger RNA. And I'm going to talk uh, about uh, my experience of using this uh, in, a, in a set of tissues that we have uh, in, the, in Newcastle. So this is a typical test that I would do on a tonsil cancer. This is the hematoxylin acin, this is the P16, and this is the uh, in situ hybridization. Now you can see with this the, that you don't need a microscope to tell this has got overexpression of P16, and there's uh, evidence of uh, HPV DNA in it. Uh, and uh, I've got to say when it's like this, it's easy. But when we looked at uh, 140 cases and looked at the algorithm that we were using, we could see that essentially uh, we can split them into P16 positive and P16 negative cases. But then when we apply the ish, then what happens is we tend to get uh, the informative groups, which are the ones that are uh, uh, HPV negative, they're P16 negative, HPV DNA negative and the ones that are positive, P16 positive, HPV DNA positive. But then we get this group here where we're not really quite sure what's happening. We've got overexpression of a surrogate marker, but we cannot demonstrate any HPV DNA by ish technology. We can basically resolve these ones by going to a PCR, which, makes, uh, which is more sensitive, and then by applying a standard uh, non-quantitative PCR to this material, then we can usually transfer these into the, uh, to this particular group here. And in fact, the work that we did uh, looking at uh, qPCR, looking at copy number, uh, helps to uh, resolve this group uh, uh, very well against the gold standard. So I'm going to talk now about my experience of uh, using uh, RNA scope, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, Liverpool University and with uh, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, who did all the testing. And essentially, we had 78 oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas with clinical outcome data. Now, it sounds like a small set, but this was a unique set because we had fresh frozen material for all of these cases. And those fresh frozen cases uh, had had Q RT PCR done for the three most common HPV uh, genotypes, high risk genotypes in oropharyngeal cancer uh, HPV 16, 18, and 33. So we'd basically got a uh, gold standard or reference test with which to uh, compare other tests against. So we can do an analytical uh, validation as well as a clinical validation by looking at the outcome data. So we com the comparison tests were we did a qPCR for the DNA on the frozen tissue, but uh, more interestingly, we looked at uh, this portfolio of tests, which are the two tests that I do routinely in my clinical practice, which is the P16 immunohistochemistry and the high-risk HPV DNA ish using the Ventana platform, and then looking at uh, RNA scope. This is just uh, an outline of the, the cohort to just indicate that basically there's a mix of positive and negative cases in here. We see the typical uh, uh, mean age change. Uh, we, for the positive cases are slightly younger than the, uh, the ones that are negative. And in terms of the, uh, the, the mix of the patients, then we've got uh, the majority of our patients are male. So I'll just uh, turn the lights off just to show you some of these photomicrographs. Um, and this, uh, this panel, as you've already been introduced to RNA scope, shows uh, essentially parallel tests on serial sections. We have the, the test looking for the uh, HPV RNA then the bacterial gene, which is, uh, should, should not be expressed in the human tissues, and then this uh, constitutively active gene, uh, the ubiquitin C. So these are two tests or representative tests from the ones that were HPV-16 positive by our uh, reference test by the qPCR. 
And you can see here, this is uh, very strongly expressed, co-localizing to the tumor cells for the uh, high-risk HPV uh, mRNA. And this is a cocktail mix, so there's lots of different uh, our, uh, uh, oligos uh, in this mix. And the DAB is uh, nicely clean, and then the ubiquitin C, again, very, very high levels. The panel uh, at the bottom just shows uh, a case that was HPV-16 uh, positive, but a, at a much uh, less uh, strong intensity, but still very convincingly positive for uh, RNA scope and uh, a nice internal positive control there. The RNA scope also picked up some of the cases that were HPV-18 positive, and again, this just shows a nice co-localization at a high intensity for the, uh, for the HPV-18 positive case. The DAB, again, is very, uh, uh, very convincingly negative, and the ubiquitin C is positive. When we did the uh, sensitivity and specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value against the other tests, um, we can see that essentially this is by comparison to our gold standard or reference test, the high-risk HPV QRT-PCR. We found that the RNA scope essentially was highly sensitive and highly specific, and by comparison with the other tests, uh, seemed to perform uh, at least comparably and at an even uh, higher level. So the, uh, the sensitivity, this represents uh, essentially uh, one, one false negative and this is uh, three false positives. This is one of these uh, false positive tests and it's at a slightly higher magnification this. And you can see that the, uh, the DAB again is... Uh, is negative, the ubiquitin C's work nicely. But we felt uh, when we analyzed this, and we analyzed this using two pathologists uh, with consensus diagnosis, we felt there was enough brown signal in this to give this uh, a positive call, despite the fact on the uh, Q RT PCR it was negative. You can put the lights up now. So the sensitivity and specificity of the test against the analytical gold standard we think was, was very, very impressive. But uh, analytical uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity is, is no substitute for biologically informing what's going on. And because we had outcome data for these uh, individuals, we can see that the RNA scope, when, when it's positive, uh, separates very nicely from the HPV negative cases both on disease-specific survival and on overall survival as well. And when we compared that to the, uh, the gold standard test here, the QRT-PCR, we can see that essentially the three-year survival probabilities are comparable with the gold standard test. And uh, in fact, when you look at the log rank, the p-values uh, p is slightly lower than the other tests indicating that as a single format test, uh, it performs very highly and is able to separate those two groups out. You don't have to take my word for it. In fact, uh, this work was all done before I, I got my hands on the RNA scope or even heard about it. And Jim Lewis's group uh, in St. Louis was where I first heard about RNA scope. And uh, Jim Lewis uh, applied the test to a larger cohort of patients, uh, 195 patients with follow-up data, and was able to separate them into these uh, uh, outcome groups, the RNA scope positive and uh, RNA scope negative tests. You can see that these uh, Kaplan Meier curves are very, very similar to the ones that we had with our cohort of patients. And this, this work is uh, published in American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Jim Lewis's uh, work is, uh, is very well known, and he's done other, other work with uh, RNA scope as well. But uh, just to uh, underscore the importance of uh, the test uh, and the, the acceptance of the test, in, certainly in the head and neck community, uh, is this paper has just been published by William Westra's group, uh, who've probably done the most extensive uh, publishing around oropharyngeal cancer and were the, one of the first groups to... Uh, to tell us about uh, the importance of human papillomavirus in, 
in oropharyngeal cancer. And he's applied the test to his large cohort of patients with oropharyngeal cancer and find it's, finds it uh, classifies the, uh, the tumours uh, accurately into the groups. Not only that, uh, he had uh, an interesting group of patients where they were P16 positive, but were always consistently negative for high-risk HPV DNA by ish methods, in situ hybridization methods. And he, he looked at these cases. There were just 25 cases, but he found with these 25 cases that he was, he was able to resolve uh, those cases by using RNA scope. And 21 of those cases had uh, uh, evidence of uh, high-risk HPV messenger RNA using RNA scope. And this panel of uh, photomicrographs, which is in his paper, demonstrates that. Uh, this is just the hematoxylin A's in uh, stained section of the squamous cell carcinoma. By the Ventana platform, you couldn't see any HPV DNA. By this sensitive uh, uh, a DACO test using HBV16 specific probes, you can see very, very low copy number of, uh, of uh, HBV16 uh, DNA. But when you look at the RNA scope, you see lots of message there. And he makes the point that uh, the advantage of using uh, messenger RNA in situ hybridization is that you've got a natural amplification step within your tissue section. So the abundance of the, uh, the target means that you don't need to go through uh, an amplification step. There are other studies that have used RNA scope in head and neck cancer, mainly from Jim Lewis's group. And it's just to outline that uh, there's, uh, there's evidence in the literature that this is a robust test. Because I work as a pathologist in a diagnostic laboratory, then uh, when, uh, when I received this uh, press release, uh, I became very excited that uh, advanced cell diagnostics had signed up with uh, Ventana because I work in a Ventana uh, laboratory, essentially. We have a Ventana uh, service agreement, which means that all of our diagnostic platforms are, uh, are Venta Ventana machines, which meant that if this uh, test becomes commercialized and uh, stamped as an in vitro diagnostic uh, device, then I can bring it into my laboratory for the benefit of the patients. And this is just a picture of uh, our benchmark uh, ultras which are waiting for this test to be developed and brought onto this platform. The, uh, the test, as I understand it, is uh, already on the discovery units with Ventana. And in fact, all the work that I've presented uh, from, uh, from the work we did in uh, the UK was done on the, uh, the discovery unit. So just to finish off, uh, I think these are the key features of uh, detecting human papillomavirus in uh, oropharyngeal cancers with RNA scope. You get evidence of transcriptionally active uh, oncogenic HPV which means that essentially you know there's a transcriptionally active virus there. It's not just as a passenger. So you've got evidence of E6, E7 transcription. We've shown that it closely correlates with an analytical reference test or gold standard. It's clinically relevant. You can separate them into uh, prognostic groups. As I understand it, there's an FDA submission pending. So I'm hoping that it will come into uh, an in vitro diagnostic device that I can use. It's got efficacy as a single test, so you don't have to uh, introduce it into an algorithmic approach, potentially onto an automated staining platform with the benefits of that reducing turnaround time and cost effectiveness. In terms of further work, as a pathologist, I'm thinking about how we validate it in uh, clinical service. So then I think the next stage for us is really to look at inter-observer variation in clinical practice, to look at inter-laboratory performance, do laboratories uh, in different parts of uh, the UK or in part, different parts of the world uh, produce the same uh, quality of tests and the same test uh, classification? And then also to introduce uh, the concept of external quality assurance for the tests. This is very important because uh, as we go into the clinical trial setting, 
then we want to make sure that our patients are getting the right designation so they get entered into the, uh, uh, the right clinical trials and get the, uh, the right treatment. Just to finish off for acknowledgements, obviously to acknowledge uh, advanced cell diagnostics for access to their technology. The work was done with uh, Liverpool University and I'm based in Newcastle University and my colleague Professor Sloan is another pathologist. This work was supported by the Royal College of Surgeons uh, in England and the Wellcome Trust which is a charitable organisation. Thank you very much.